please turn with me to Genesis 36. In Genesis 36, we've been going through the Pentateuch, going through the book of Genesis, and talking about God's uh, call in our lives. And we've talked about the, the Great Commission, and we came here to Genesis 36, and just some uh, amazing truths here, even in a genealogy, some amazing truths that this genealogy communicates, and hopefully God encourages us as we, as we read through this and think about uh, his, his call on our life and the Great Commission through these verses. And if you are able to, if you would stand with me as we read God's word together from Genesis, Genesis 36, reading from the English Standard Version. I'm not going to read all of uh, Genesis 36, but kind of re- read through it. And as I read through it, kind of remind us of where we are in, uh, and what's going on in the chapter Genesis 36 is about the descendants of Esau, and they are, we are reminded several times that the descendants of Esau are called the Edomites, and we see what God's plan for them is here, his blessing on them. Verse 1, these are the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. And Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz, Basemath bore Rule, and Aholabama bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went went into a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. Then in verse 9, we see the sons of Esau and his grandsons. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. And then it lists those. And then we come to verses 15 through 19. And as we have seen that the five sons and the ten grandsons mentioned, now we see 14 chiefs. Many of them have the same names as his sons and, and grandsons. These are the chiefs, the sons of Esau, sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs Timnon, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, and so forth. Then in verse 20 uh, through verse 30, it describes the people who are in the land that the Edomites settled in and the people they dispossessed. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, and so forth in verses 20 through 30. Then we come to verse 31, and Moses tells us about the kings, the descendants of Esau. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites and lists those. And then we come to verse 40. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places by their names. The chiefs Timnah, Alva, Jatheth, Aholabama, Elah, Penan, Kenaz, Timan, Mibzar, Magdiel, and Eram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is, Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. May God encourage us through his word this morning. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... This morning, I do think of our fathers and this institution of of fatherhood that you have created. Uh, My heart is is heavy this morning for those who've who've lost their fathers, some just very recently even, the last few days or weeks, months, and we would ask for your grace on their lives. We pray for those who may be struggling uh, just with some other types of sorrow this morning as they think about fatherhood some who may want to be fathers and and aren't, those who may have a strange relationship with their father or as fathers with their sons. Lord, we recognize that even in this this institution of fatherhood that you've given, uh, the the fall has has, uh, caused grief and and sorrow and, and pain. And so we pray for the gospel of your grace to sustain us in pain. 
And above all, Father, we would ask that as we think about this human institution of fatherhood that you've given us, that we would understand that it is just a shadow of our relationship with you, our great heavenly Father. Thank you that you've given us the right to call you Father through faith in your son Jesus and help us to worship you more as a result of thinking about earthly fatherhood. And we pray this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. This morning, I want to begin, as we did last week, talking about the Great Commission. Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, gives the Great Commission to his disciples. He tells them that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, And behold, I'm with you even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. That's what Jesus tells his disciples to be about. And it is the mission that you and I have as well. It's the commission that our church has been given to make disciples. And as I mentioned last week, there are some ways that we sometimes struggle in fulfilling the Great Commission. Sometimes we fail to understand exactly what the Great Commission is. We don't understand what it means to disciple. And to disciple, what we understand that to mean rightly is we are called by God to tell people, look, you have been separated from God because of sin. Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life. God the Son lived a perfect life, died on the cross for your sins, was risen from the dead, and now by placing your faith and your trust in him, you can have eternal life. You can have a relationship with God. And we we communicate that message, and then we encourage people, as your life is transformed by the gospel, as you receive new life, you should live in obedience to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we describe what living in obedience to God through a transformed life looks like. That's discipleship. And sometimes we fail to understand the content of the message that we're to take, and so we don't practice the Great Commission rightly. And sometimes we fail in our task of Great Commission ministry because we just don't care. We don't care about the nations. God has called us to be passionate about seeing the nations come into relationship with him, and sometimes we fail because we don't care. And our lack of caring about the nations is manifested in what we think about or don't think about, what we do or don't do. We betray that we do not care about the nations. And so we fail in the Great Commission. Genesis 36, I think, is a great antidote to failure in Great Commission thinking. As I mentioned last week, this passage is hitting at a great time in the life of our church as we begin to to think about our missions ministry, and we are entering a time in our church's life where we are taking greater ownership of our Great Commission ministry, our task of proclaiming the gospel to the nations. And this passage, I believe, helps us as we think rightly about this ministry that God is calling us to. And as we enter this time in our church's life where we have a greater responsibility over this ministry, we understand we are not going to be successful. We are not going to be successful in fulfilling Great Commission ministry unless we are passionate about God being worshipped. And as I mentioned last week, that the main thing that I want us to think about, the main thing I want us to, to grasp as we think about Genesis 36, is that God's people love God being worshipped. And if God's people love God being worshipped, they are going to be excited about a diverse group of people worshipping God. 
If we love God being worshiped as God's people, then we are going to be excited about people from different tribes and tongues and nations worshiping God. That's going to to thrill us. That's going to excite us. And it's going to compel us in the ministries that we engage in. It's going to change how we spend our life. If we're excited about the idea of God being worshiped, it's going to propel us to be faithful in great commission ministry. Now, let me kind of remind you about what we talked about last week. First of all, we talked about the Edomites, these descendants of Esau in Genesis 36. And we kind of walked through Genesis 36 as we just read here a moment ago. And and basically what we saw as we went through Genesis 36, the Edomites, these descendants of Esau, were uh, a, a group that settled south of the Dead Sea, and as they settled in this region south of the Dead Sea, they became a confederation of tribes, and they, they were a, a people with culture. They dispossessed another people who were there, and they intermarried with some of them, and so they formed this, this nation south of the Dead Sea. God's prophetic word to Rebekah was fulfilled. Esau becomes this nation. We see that there are kings of the Edomites that that reign there. There's this uh, elective process by which these kings rule, and they they are people of value to God. They get all of Genesis 36. It's all about the Edomites, and so they are a people of value to God. That's what we see in Genesis 36. God's prophetic word is fulfilled, and these these people are valued. The the blessing that was promised them by uh, by Isaac is is beginning to be fulfilled. Now, we go a little bit broader, right? We talk about the Edomites in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible. What do we see about the Edomites in the Pentateuch? Well, some years go by, hundreds of years go by, and the Israelites are preparing to go back from their time of uh, wandering the wilderness, they're preparing to re-enter in the promised land after being in Egypt and wandering around the wilderness. Now they're entering the promised land, and they encounter the Edomites in Numbers. Numbers uh, 20 describes the Israelites and their interaction with the Edomites. And what do the Edomites tell them? They say, you can't go through our country, you have to go around. And the Israelites say, please, please, please. And the Edomites say, no, no, you have to go around. And so the Israelites have to take this very long detour around the region in which the Edomites reigned. Then you come to the book of Deuteronomy. And now, my my family and I were recently traveling from Florida, and that's kind of a long journey. And by God's providential grace, we were traveling on National Donut Day. And uh, Krispy Kreme was offering free donuts, and so we believed we'd take this short five-minute detour and get our free Krispy Kreme donut. And a short five-minute detour turned into a 45-minute uh, shortcut. You know, it was just a, a terrible little detour there, and tensions got, you know, a little high sometimes and navigation and all those things, as is the case. Now, if you were an Israelite and you had been forced to take your family and everything and go all the way around Edom, you might be a little bit annoyed, uh, understandably so. But when you come to the book of Deuteronomy and Moses is saying, hey, remember how we did this? And remember how this happened? Instead of talking about how bad the Edomites are and what big jerks they are, Moses talks about how they are our brothers. He says, you know, the Edomites, they're our brothers. And he says that... Um, He talks about how God has provided, this is so important, God has provided a means by which the Edomite can come into the assembly of God. In other words, Moses, in the context of the Pentateuch, as he talks about the Edomites, sees a future in which Edomites are worshiping Yahweh God. That's Edomites in the Pentateuch. Now, you broaden the scope a little bit, and you talk about Edomites in the Old Testament. And as you talk about the Edomites in the Old Testament, the picture seems a little bit bleak because these Edomites don't really cooperate with God's vision for them. The Edomites become enemies of Israel. Saul fights against the Edomites. David fights against the Edomites. The prophets prophesy against Edomites. The book of Obadiah, all about how bad the Edomites are, and God's judgment on them. It talks about how the Edomites rejoiced whenever God dealt with Israel and whenever they were carried off into captivity. The Edomites are happy about this. And so Obadiah says, look, Edomites, watch out because you're going to face God's 
judgment as well. In fact, let me read a little bit from Amos, the prophet Amos. And in Amos 1, we see that God's going to judge. Verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he, that's Edom, pursued his brother, that's Israel, with the sword and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So God says, look, Edom, I'm gonna deal with you. You've rejected the Lord, you've rejected Yahweh, you've rejected worship of God, you've opposed his people, you're going to be dealt with. We see that throughout the prophetic books we see it in Amos. But here's, here's what I want you to see. Then you come to Amos 9. And in Amos 9, verse 10, the prophet is talking to the, the sinners of my people and how they're going to die. Then verse 11 of Amos 9. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruin and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. Do, do you see what God is envisioning in the future through the prophet Amos. He is envisioning a future in which after there has been judgment, the people of Edom will be called the people of God. God is going to call them by his name. And so all the nations that have opposed God are eventually going to be brought into relationship with God. And how is this relationship with God going to come about? It's going to be through a descendant of David. It's going to be through this Davidic house. It's going to be through this, this future ruler, through the Messiah. And so throughout the prophetic books, even as Edom opposes God and opposes his people, and whenever God's people are dealt with, the Edomites are like, yeah, we're so glad that Israel is getting theirs. They are not friends of Israel. They're not friends of God's people. And yet, even as God says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to deal with this, God still envisions a future in which the Edomites will be worshipers of Yahweh God, a future in which they'll come into relationship with God through the Messiah, that's still God's future plan for the Edomites. Isn't that amazing? Then we come to the Edomites in the New Testament. The Edomites in the New Testament. The Edomites are carried away into captivity. They fall under the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks. But, but there's still kind of this, this, this region in which their descendants live. Herod the Great is a descendant of Esau. He's an Edomite. His father was an Edomite from that, that region. Then we come, we come to Acts 15. In fact, if you have your Bibles there, why don't you turn to the book of Acts? Acts 15. In Acts 15, something very interesting happens. The Gentiles are coming to faith in Jesus. And the Jews aren't quite sure how to handle this. Because what's happening is the Gentiles are hearing the gospel of Jesus and they're responding in faith and they're coming in, they're, they're being recognized as people of God and yet they don't become Jews. And the Jews are kind of like, uh, what's happening here? Don't you kind of have to become Jewish? We understand Gentiles coming into relationship with God, but they, their vision was place your faith in Jesus and become Jewish and, and that's not happening. And the Jews are really confused, particularly the Jewish Jews, those in Jerusalem. And the, the church kind of meets together and they're trying to, to figure out what to, what to do here. And Peter says this, kind of in the beginning of verse 8, he says, God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them, that's the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts, how? By faith. And then Peter goes on and says, look, we shouldn't put the Gentiles under the yoke of pursuing salvation through obedience to the law. And he says, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Gentiles are going to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ just like the Jews. 
And James listens to what Peter says and he agrees with this. And in verse 15, he says, with this, and that this there means the inclusion of the Gentiles and the people of God. With this, all the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And then James begins quoting Amos 9. Now, what does Amos 9 talk about? Amos 9 talks about who? The Edomites. James tells us that this prophecy about the Edomites and the and the nations worshiping God through the Messiah is now being fulfilled before their very eyes as people place their faith in Jesus Christ. He says, this is James speaking again, verse 16, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. As he quotes Isaiah and I believe, or as he quotes Amos and he's also quoting Isaiah here. We'll talk about that in a second. What James is saying is, look, this time that was foreseen by the prophets in which the Edomites and the Gentiles and the nations will come and worship Yahweh God, we're seeing it. He quotes Isaiah 45. I think he alludes to it as well, James does. And what does Isaiah 45 say? Isaiah 45 pictures this time when the nations are coming together. In Isaiah 45, kind of beginning in verse 20, Isaiah is saying, look, uh, you survivors of the nations, you worshipers of idols, you carry about your wooden idols, you keep praying to a God that cannot save. He says in verse 21, there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none besides me. God is saying, look, I, I, you've worshiped these worthless wooden idols. You need to know that, that there is no God but me. I've, I've judged you, I've judged the nations, and now it's time to turn and worship me. Turn to me, verse 22 of Isaiah 45, and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord, only in Yahweh, it shall be said of me, are righteousness and strength to him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. And then Isaiah 45, 25 says this, and this is such an important verse. In the Lord, in Yahweh, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. What does that mean? How does one become an offspring of Israel? Well, the New Testament tells us. It's, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Only in me, says the prophet Isaiah, only in the Lord, only in Jesus Christ do we come into relationship with God. And in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the offspring of Israel, all the sons and daughters of Abraham shall be justified and shall glory. How do you become a son or daughter of Abraham? Is it through physical birth into the people of Israel? Or is it more than that? See the book of Galatians. It talks about how, verse 7, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. How do the Gentiles, how do, the, how do Edomites factor into the New Testament? Where do we see the Edomites? The Edomites become part of the people of God through faith in Jesus. It was Father's Day, and I was kind of thinking about this, this reality, this, this idea of the, the people of God. And, and in first service, uh, Doug Wright was praying for our, our offering, and as he began to pray, he began his prayer, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Now, what gives... Doug Wright, now I don't know all his ethnic makeup, but I'm pretty sure he's not Jewish. 
He seems very Gentile to me. What gives Doug Wright the ability to say, Abba, Father? Who does that guy think he is? It's faith in Jesus. He's a son of Abraham. Now, I believe that God still has, has a plan for, for ethnic Jews, for ethnic Israel, and yet, and yet adoption by God is, is a real thing. You and I are the sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. The Edomites become sons and daughters of God in the New Testament through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's, let's go broader. Let's talk now then about the Edomites and what does this teach us about God's plan of blessing for the nations? The Edomites in Genesis 36 have value. In the Pentateuch, there's this time and vision in which they become part of the assembly of Israel. The Old Testament envisions a future in which the Edomites and all nations will worship Yahweh God. The New Testament says the Edomites are going to become worshipers of Yahweh God through adoption into the people of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that reality teach us? Let's talk about some principles here. The Edomites and God's plan of blessing to the nations. Number one is this that I want you to think about. God plans a kingdom made up of many people. God plans a kingdom made up of many people. God has a plan from eternity past to establish his kingdom, and his plan from eternity past is that there would be a lot of people in it. In fact, when I think about my life as a Christian and what I pictured of heaven, there were kind of two M words that I, I think of when I think of my vision of heaven and who's in it. One M word is the word multitude. I just picture a lot of people. Revelation 7 talks about a, um, a, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. And so I, I imagine a multitude. And, and the other M word that I thought of when I thought of heaven and the people in heaven is, is the word mercy. Mercy. When I look around in heaven... And I see you there. I'm going to think, wow, God is merciful. And you're going to look at me and think, wow, that God is very gracious. There's no one we're going to look at in heaven and think, that guy deserved to be here. That lady really knew. Mercy, okay, mercy. Think of the parable in, in Luke 14, talking about the invitation to the, this great banquet. And, and everyone kind of has these really lame excuses as to why they're not going to come. And, and the master tells the servant to to go in and, and to, to um, go to the streets and the lanes of the city, bringing the poor and the crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, look, I've done it. There's still room. The master said, um, go to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. And as you think about that picture, there's going to be no one in the heaven celebrating this, this banquet that you say, that guy, that lady deserves to be here. There's going to be a multitude, and it's going to be a sign of God's mercy. God plans a kingdom made up of many people. Now, here's the second thing I want us to think about, though. God desires a diversity of people to worship him. There's a book by John Piper called Let the Nations Be Glad that I read in January of 2000 that was just life transforming for me. And so a lot of what I'm, he, he's the one that kind of helped me think about something else here that I hadn't thought about before. You see, as I had thought about heaven, I kind of thought about it like a big bowl of, of jelly bellies. You know, jelly bellies, they're like, they're not like gourmet jelly beans is what they're called. They're not that low class stuff. They're, they're not the Brock stuff. They're the Gourmet jelly beans, right? And they have all these different flavors. And I kind of thought of heaven as like a, a big bowl of jelly bellies. And uh, what happens whenever you grab a, a big handful of jelly bellies? You, you get diversity, okay? Now, well, unless you're my, my kids, then it's like divine election because they pick out all the red ones. But you should, if you're doing it right, if you're doing it the way God intended, you're going to get diversity. You have a big, big bowl of jelly bellies, grab a big, I grab it like this. Um, there's going to be, there's going to be the, the, the coconut, there's going to be the coffee flavor, there's going to be the chocolate, there's going to be the cinnamon, there's going to be popcorn, what, all that stuff is going to be in that handful, right? That's what I thought heaven was. God's going to grab a big group of people, and because he's grabbing a big group of people, he can't help but get, you know, 
the, the diversity. A big bunch of people from the world. You get people from Iran. You get Latinos. You get uh, people from Asia. You just get a big handbag, right? But that's not biblical. That's not biblical thinking. Diversity isn't just a byproduct of having a lot of people. It's not a lot of people result diversity. Diversity itself is a goal of God. Revelation 5 talks about this scroll in heaven, and John wants someone to be able to open the scroll, and he weeps because no one is able. And they look in, they, they look in uh, all over to, to find someone who has the, the ability to, to open this, this scroll. They find the lamb. And they sing, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, listen to what he says, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you've made them a, a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. In other words, diversity is, is part of the, the goal of God's salvific plan. The plan to ransom people was to ransom a people that are diverse, the Edomites, the Edomites were no longer a political entity, and yet, and yet they're still part of God's salvific plan, the, the ethnos, the, the ethnicities here. Think about the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not, hey, I want you to save a bunch of political states, but to save people, ethnicities. That word nation there means ethnicities, ethnicities people groups. You see this throughout Scripture Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. That means these, these people groups, not these political entities. God isn't saving political entities. He's saving people groups. Romans 15, 11, praise the Lord all you Gentiles and let the peoples praise him. Galatians 3, 8, in the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations, all the peoples shall be blessed in you. Revelation 15, 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy, for all the nations will come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been revealed. If you understand that adversity is a purpose and not just a result of God's plan of salvation, it should significantly change how you engage in evangelism, shouldn't it? God's passion is not just to see a bunch of people get saved, although, of course, that's what he calls us to as well. But God's purpose is to see peoples get saved. It's why we're willing to invest money to send someone to a remote part of the world when there are plenty of people in central Illinois who haven't heard the gospel yet. We're passionate about reaching the peoples, not just a large number of people. Here's the third thing that I want us to think about applicationally here, or, or implicationally. Number three, God grants kingdom membership only through Christ. As we think about Genesis 36, the Edomites, and, and the implications here, what we also understand is that God grants kingdom membership only through Christ. Now, now, brothers and sisters, this is, a, this is a huge thing here. There are several times in my life where I have asked or been asked significant life-changing questions. Um, Whitney, will you marry me? You know, really could have gone either way, Right? Life-changing that she said yes. Remember May of 2000, we were visiting Peoria for the first time, and it was, it was late at night. We had just met with uh, a youth pastor search committee from Bethany Baptist Church, and we're, we're in our room late at night, and Whitney and I look at each other, and we, we ask ourselves the question, could we really leave our family and move to central Illinois? Could we move to Peoria, Illinois? Is this what God is calling us to do? answer yes a few years later being asked would you be interested in planting a church uh, yeah, I don't know yes those answers to those questions change 
change the trajectory of my life all in good ways. And, and the same is true for you. There are, there are questions in your life that you can think, okay, boy, if I'd answered that question differently, my life would have taken a whole different direction. I want to ask three questions to you this morning as we think about this, this third point that God grants kingdom membership only through Christ. I want to ask three questions. And I believe that if we answer these three questions, each in the affirmative, it should radically change the trajectory of our individual lives and the trajectory of our church. These are questions that are not original to me. They're also asked by John Piper and Let the Nations Be Glad. And again, I believe these are, are such life-changing questions. Here, here's the first one. The first question is, will anyone experience eternal conscious torment under God's wrath? Some Christians would say, or some people who would identify themselves as Christians would, would say, no, there's, there's, no one's going to experience eternal conscious torment under God's wrath. But, but will anyone? Here, here's what Scripture says. I believe that Scripture says absolutely. And obviously how we answer this question changes how we view the task of missions. Will anyone experience eternal conscious torment under God's wrath? And here's what I believe we see in Scripture. Daniel chapter 12, Daniel's talking about the resurrection. In verse 2, it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. So some resurrected to everlasting life, some lasted, uh, resurrected to eternal contempt, judgment. If life is eternal, so is the judgment. If heaven is eternal, so is hell. Matthew nine forty three. it's better to enter life with two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Matthew 25 says some will go to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, if life is eternal, so is punishment. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, this is a very significant passage, I think, as we think of, of a theology of hell and what makes hell, hell says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. It's, it's everlasting. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. What is the definition of, of hell here? It's being away from the presence of God, from the glory of his might. And when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Revelation 14 describes the torment that goes up forever and ever, no rest, day or night, for those who've worshiped the beast. Will anyone experience eternal conscious torment under God's wrath? The answer in scripture seems very clear to me, yes. You say, well, Daniel, I don't understand this, and I don't understand this about it, and I, I struggle with this, and I'd say, you know what? I, I understand those struggles because it, it's certainly something that, that I've struggled with as well. But let me suggest to you that oftentimes the fault of the struggle lies not with God but with me and a lack of understanding of, of the nature of God's holiness. The severity of a punishment is based upon the severity of the crime. The value of that which we have committed a crime against. Now this isn't a perfect illustration, but just for example, a, a few Weeks ago, my family and I were in Chicago, and we went to the, the Van Gogh exhibit at the Chicago Museum of Art. And imagine I had gone into the Chicago Museum of Art, and there on the wall was a little uh, printed out sign saying, um, you know, line forms here. And I, there's a security guard there. And I walked up, and I pulled this line, starts here, paper off the wall, and in front of the security guard, I ripped it into shreds and threw it in his face. Okay. He'd probably have some words for me, right? Not very nice words. He'd be concerned about me and my sanity and whether or not I should remain in the museum and might ask me to leave. There'd be some sort of consequence. And now imagine 
I walked up next to the security guard and I pulled the Van Gogh painting off the wall and began to rip that up and threw that in his face. Uh, The consequences would be much more severe, right? Why? I did the same thing. Well, the reason the consequences would be more severe is because of the value of that which I had committed the crime against. And some would say, well, how can there be a, a, a punishment that seems infinite whenever we've lived a, a finite amount of life? And I, I believe the answer to helping us begin to understand that is to understand the infinite holiness of God. And as we begin to comprehend more and more the infinite holiness of God, we understand the terrible punishment, the rejection of him demands. Nevertheless, we're not going to unpack all the understanding of a doctrine of hell this morning, but what what I want you to understand first is this question. Will anyone experience eternal conscious torment under God's wrath? Scripture tells us the answer is yes. A second question to consider here, is the work of Christ necessary? Is the work of Christ necessary? And what this question is getting at is this. Is it possible that there are two or three or a lot of different roads to God? And and Jesus represents one road and maybe the easiest. So here's Jesus. He dies on the cross. And he's, he's one way to God. But I could also follow a different path. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult. Maybe I have to do some more things. But it's also a way that I can deal with my sin and come into relationship with God. And here's what Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that the answer to the question, is the work of Christ absolutely necessary, is yes. First Timothy 2.5 says, there's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. How do we mediate between God and, and men? There is only one way through Jesus Christ. We've talked about Acts 4.12. Only way to to God, one name under heaven by which we must be saved, Jesus Christ. A revelation, five, talks, we mentioned that earlier, talks about how only the lamb was able to open the, the, the scroll. There is no one else through whom we can come into relationship with God but Jesus Christ. Romans chapter five, verse 17, talks about the one man, Adam's trespass. It says, uh, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. There is salvation only in Jesus Christ. Is there a hell where people will experience eternal conscious torment? Yes. Is the work of Christ necessary to deal with sin? Scripture tells us yes. And here's The third question, and and this third question is also so, so important. Is conscious faith in Jesus Christ necessary? In other words, must a person know about Jesus Christ in order to be saved? And, And this perhaps is the question that we struggle with the most, and yet if we answer it in the, in the affirmative, it should change how we live on a moment-by-moment basis. It should change the trajectory of our life. And here's what some would say. Some would say, yes, there's a hell. Yes, there's a place of, of torment. Yes, people are going to suffer under God's wrath. And yes, Jesus is necessary. There was no other way to deal with sin. But, but maybe a person can receive the benefits of Jesus without knowing about Jesus. Maybe someone who looks at a tree or looks at the sky or looks at the idea of of space and thinks about all those things might not know about Jesus but can still receive the benefits of Jesus' death apart from consciously placing their trust and faith in him. And, And here's what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ were a watershed event. Acts 4, Peter says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this Jesus, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man that they just healed is standing before you well. 
And then he says this about Jesus. Peter says this about Jesus in Acts 4.11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is it. Acts 17, Paul would say this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and by the, of this he has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead." The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a watershed event in human history, and there is now no other name given among men by which we can receive eternal life other than the name of Jesus Christ. And I understand, and we're not going to get into all this this morning, but I understand there are a a host of questions we have as we think about that doctrine, but here's what I want you to, to, to grasp with me. The answer to all three questions is yes. Is there a place of eternal conscious torment under God's wrath? Yes. Is the work of Christ necessary? Yes. Is conscious faith in Christ absolutely necessary for eternal life? Yes. What does that mean for our church? It means that we must be passionate. If we love others, we must be passionate about communicating the necessity of consciously placing your faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. That means that the direction of our church, how we spend our finances, what we spend our time doing, what we spend our time talking about, what we spend our time thinking about, must be driven and fueled by great commission passion. If we answer those three questions in the affirmative, it changes our lives. And hopefully, the lives of the people with whom we come into contact. Here's the fourth thing. As we think about the Edomites, Genesis 36, and God's plan of blessing for the nations, here's the fourth thing. God proclaims his kingdom through us, through the church. The task of the church is to be proclaiming God's blessings in Christ to the world. How? How are we going to do this as a church? It's going to be a a continuing journey for us, I believe. God's going to continue to grow us in this. One way is by prayer. If you are not a person who is praying regularly and and passionately for those who do not know God to become worshipers of God, you're not a person who's passionate about God or about the Great Commission. If your prayers are very much about, hey God, help me with this toe that's hurting, God, help me with this financial situation, God, help me with this, and you're not passionately praying about people who do not know the Lord coming into relationship with God, people who are in your sphere and people who are in the remotest parts of the earth, if that's not part of your prayer life and if your prayer life isn't part of your daily life, the likelihood is that you're not a person who's passionate about the Great Commission. And I'm I'm speaking to myself as well here. It involves us giving financially. God would call us to to give of our financial resources to the the missions ministries that our our church is supporting. And it means that we're going to be a church that's that's planting both locally and to the remotest parts of the world, planting gospel-centered churches to take the good news of Jesus other places. It means that in our relationships, we are going to be gospel-centered in our relationships, great commission-focused in our relationships. We know the the content of the gospel, and we're communicating that to to people we love. Look, here's how you come into a relationship with God. Here's what it means to place your faith in, in God, and we're communicating that, to place your faith in Christ for eternal life. It means we're going to be Welcoming the sojourner. We're going to be welcoming the foreigner. Our culture is a culture, as we talked about last week, that is, that is changing rapidly. And some of the changes in our culture are, are for the worse. But the increased diversity in our nation is not a change for the worse. The fact that there are more people in your life from 
Iran is not a bad thing, or the fact that there are more Latinos is not a bad thing, the fact that there are more Canadians is not a bad thing, or people from Oklahoma even. I mean, none of these things are bad. This is good. And for people who are passionate about seeing diverse groups of people come into worship of God, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. It means, as a church, we're sending we're sending. My prayer has been that God would continue to raise up missionaries through Bethany Community Church. I believe that God has positioned our church at a very unique time to be a gospel-sending church. In fact, this morning, if you're thinking, boy, how would God have me go and, and reach the nations? How would God have me reach other people? It begins by you being a person who's reaching others with the gospel now in the culture that he's placed you. But we the, the, the church would love to talk to you about how we can prepare you to, to be sent and do the things that God has called us as a church to do, to be a representative of Bethany Community Church reaching the nations. We have resources and training and life important we want to do to you to help you in your task of reaching the nations, to help us in our ministry of reaching the nations. We'd love, we'd love to talk to you. God's people God's people love God being worshipped. And God's people, because they love God being worshipped, are going to be passionate about seeing God worshipped by a diversity of people through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for the life that we have in his name and Father, we pray that you would help us as a church here at Bethany Community and, and other local churches who are represented here. Lord, help us to be faithful in this endeavor. We are not able, we are not capable of, of being faithful to this on our own. We need your life-giving power. We need to be in your son, Jesus. Help us to do so. Help us to be so by your grace. We love you. We want to see others love you and worship you. Help us to do so. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen.